Dear Audrey, well, this is the beginning. Such an amazing feeling, and I want to say that I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to our next chapter, and I believe that God is on our side. I will be praying for you and for us. As always, there is so much I want to say to you, but it all just gets lost in my thoughts. You are beautiful. Cheers to our first letter. Love, Jeremy. Hello, everyone. A warm, warm welcome to every one of you. A privilege to be with you. It was this past Sunday that I was driving through some of the suburbs in Johannesburg, and I noticed this dear elderly couple holding hands, walking toward the park. And in my heart, not knowing anything about them, I just sensed their love and devotion and passion for one another. That they'd obviously made a choice long time ago to commit to one another, to choose each other till death do them part. You know, many of us have gone to weddings, and weddings are so special. And I think what makes a wedding so meaningful are the vows that the couple make to each other. As they look into each other's eyes and they say, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Today, I want to speak in and around the choice till death do us part. And this applies to the church in Smyrna, the church that we are studying in the book of Revelation. Here, Jesus introduces himself in the book of Revelation as the first and the last, the amen, the faithful and true witness. And it's to the believers in Smyrna that he says, I want you to be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. And it's as if his words sound like wedding vows till death do us part. And here Jesus makes a promise to these churches that he is indeed the first and the last. And he says, listen, I've started with you and I'm here with you to the very end. I'm committed to you and I'm in this relationship for good forever. And I think sometimes in our own human nature, we kind of battle to comprehend such an amazing commitment. It's not often that we can find a love that lasts a lifetime. And especially Jesus has promised that not only is he with us now, but also for all eternity. And so here the book of Revelation begins with a description of who Jesus is. And then the love letters to these seven churches in Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. And it's an invitation to the church to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom, Jesus. And, And the letters are filled with Compassion, they're filled with love, they're filled with concern, and also direction and and clarity in how the church is going to overcome the various uncertainties and pressures, as well as preparing them for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so as we're looking at these letters together, we're looking at how, focusing on the words of Jesus and how they correlate to wedding preparations so that we can be the bride, the church, ready for his return. You know, I believe that su- successful marriages, uh, they are based in, in, in love for one another, another, but also a radical commitment to each other and to Jesus. That there's a choice that the couple need to make to choose Jesus every day and choose one another. It's like a threefold covenant. And I'm not talking about getting saved every day or married every day. I'm talking about that there's a tendency in our human nature to sometimes choose the wrong things over the most important relationships. The tendency in us to drift, the tendency in us to compromise, the tendency in us to to be passive and choose those wrong things. Because every relationship, every marriage has seasons and has tests and challenges and it's a choice that gets us through. Life is built on choices. You know, for the marriage to work, for Lee and I, we, we, we need to recognize that we're going to choose one another daily, that I choose her again, 
that I choose to love her. I choose to serve her. I choose to protect her. I choose to partner with her in the mission that God has for her life. That when things get hard, I choose us. When money's in short supply, I choose us. When we can't seem to, to get along, we, we're going to work together. We choose us. We choose our future together. When things are going wrong and hell's breaking loose, we choose to stay. We choose us. And so marriage is more than just a beautiful wedding day, but it's about a choice, a promise to stay committed and faithful until death do us part. And this is the same choice that's facing the church in Smyrna, to be faithful under huge pressure, to be faithful under until death, their bridegroom to their bridegroom Jesus. And you know, that commitment to a marriage or that commitment to a relationship is the same as that commitment to Jesus. It involves commitment. It involves choices. It involves covenant. It, enjoy, it involves a faithfulness to Him. And so it's, it's as if every day we, we're making the choice, Jesus, I have so many different choices, but I'm choosing you today. I'm choosing to love you and worship you and follow you. Jesus, I'm choosing you to change my life and lead me and guide me and shape me. And so here we look at this letter to the church in Smyrna. And as I've been studying these churches, my heart has been so moved with just so much love and respect and compassion for what these churches were going through. And here Jesus in Revelations 2 verse 8, he says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, says Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And so it's because of the believers in Smyrna, they, they, they refuse to compromise their faith in Jesus. As, an, as a result, they're going through all forms of opposition and persecution. And things aren't looking good for this precious church. The interesting thing about Smyrna, it was known as one of the finest seaports in the world. In fact, it was known for its beauty and its architecture and its gorgeous flowers and this almost tropical climate. And then they had the exclusive rights to import and export uh, the fragrant spice called myrrh. Some people believe that's where the name Smyrna came from, the, the spice myrrh, Smyrna. But Smyrna had something else that was interesting, its history. Its citizens took great pride in its history because in 600 B.C., the city was destroyed and conquered, and here yeah, it was just a little humble village. And then years later, Alexander the Great came through, and he had a dream to rebuild Smyrna. And so he rebuilds it into a spectacular city. And so here, the, the, the beliefs and the traditional beliefs and the literature all had references to death and resurrection. That we were once a city that was once dead, but now we've come to life. And here you just see the, the relevance, the wisdom, the insight, the sensitivity of our glorious Savior, Jesus. And it's at that theme, it's at that, it's at the theme that, he, that he picks this whole death and resurrection. And he writes the letter to the Christians suffering in Smyrna. And, and he knows that some of them may face death, but that in Jesus, he promises a resurrection to a better life. That there's still hope and there's still a future. He says, I am the first and the last, the one who has died and risen again. And then he says, I, I know your tribulation. I, I know the, the challenges you're going through. And Jesus himself understands he's somebody that can empathize and have sensitivity uh, to, to, to our problems and our pressures. And maybe some of you watching this morning, you're going through all types of tribulation and trials and challenges and sorrows. And Jesus says, I know. And here he's encouraging a church through this. And he says, I'm, I'm wanting you to be faithful until death. And I'll give you the crown of life. Saying, church, yes, you've chosen me before. 
but I'm asking you to choose me again in the midst of this hardship. And that's a choice that the church in Smyrna are needing to do. And to take a stand as a Christian in the Roman Empire was a real tough and challenging thing. It meant in many cases to be cast into poverty, into an impoverished state. You may lose your job because maybe you weren't, part, you weren't prepared to be part of the trade unions and to be part of the trade union, what you needed to do is you need to worship other gods of other religions. And so here, the Christians in, that, in, in this day, they say, no, no, we're not gonna do that. As a result, they ostracized. Then Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. Jesus once spoke to a young man who was speaking in and around money, and he said, take heed, beware of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of what he possesses. And then another day, Jesus spoke to a rich young man who thought it was all about just riches. And he said, listen, he said, you're a fool because you are not rich toward God. And so to the believers in Smyrna, they were rich towards God. Why? Because they had this beautiful relationship with Jesus and doing what he had called them to do. All they had was Jesus, which made them truly rich. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have Jesus, that you have to be poor. But sometimes some of us are going to have to face those t- tensions in life. Jesus said the more important thing is that what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. Jesus also says, listen, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. The slander was tough for Christians. It hurt them dearly. They were facing huge assault and criticism and slander. And the Jews at that time, not all of them, but the Jews were wanting to distance themselves from the church because the the Jews in the synagogues, they had an agreement with with the Roman Empire that they did not need to claim Caesar as Lord because they had one God. And so the Christians were threatening, in one sense, this exemption for the Jews. And so the Jews start making up all these um, accusations that they're cannibalistic. They say they eat flesh and drink blood and obviously misunderstanding the whole spirit of communion and then saying they have these love feasts where there's sexual immorality and they don't, they're anti-family. And they talk about everyone just being their brother and sister. And so there was this hatred and this slander that came against the church. And Jesus says, listen, I know the slander, I know the persecution, I know the criticism that you're facing. Understand, I understand it. I've also gone through the mockery and the accusation. And maybe some of you this morning, you're going through some form of accusation or slander that's really hurting you. And Jesus would say, I know. And then he also says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Now that wasn't good news for anyone. To be thrown in a prison in those days was a dark, rat-infested dungeon. To die would mean that you would be thrown to wild beasts in a public arena with crowds uh, mocking you and cheering you. Or maybe being burned at a stake to be a martyr for, for, for your faith. And that's exactly what happens to some of these believers. Bearing in mind Jesus, he promised, he said, listen, I'll always be with you to the very end. But sometimes you might go through trials and tribulations, be persecuted for righteousness at stake. But he says, he says, listen, I want you to be faithful until death. And so as followers of Christ, we are confronted with thousands of choices, daily choices. Maybe they don't involve death and imprisonment, but there are many dear, sincere Christians in various parts of the world that give up their lives for their faith in Jesus. But maybe some choices in just how we talk, the tone in which we talk. What are we saying? How do we handle slander and criticism, even from those who are close to us, family, colleagues, business associates, whoever? What do we watch? How do we deal with money and how do we deal uh, with our various relationships? How do we raise our children? And the list goes on and on. And it's in these moments that what we're going to do is we're going to say, Lord, uh, these choices have to reflect my choice to follow you. Lord, what are you calling me to do in these different times of te- temptation, opposition, and pressure? And our choice to follow Jesus will always be uh, tested and tempted. There's an adversary. Jesus said that there's a thief called the, the, the devil and his, his aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. 
And not only do we have the enemy that comes against our, our, our purpose in life, but also the spirit of the world against God and His church. And so what we're going to do is take us, take, knowing that taking a stand will sometimes invite opposition. Yes, it'll invite influence and impact, but also some opposition. And what we would understand also is that the devil is relentless in trying to divide uh, one another, divide us from the Lord Jesus and the church in Smyrna found that out but they never wavered in their commitment to Jesus. It didn't separate, opposition didn't separate them from one another. In fact, what it did is it brought a unity, a unity, it brought a faith, it brought a faithfulness, it brought belief, hope, and a future. And so what do we do when we're going through some of these pressures and, and, and the slander and, and the persecution and just the challenges in life? Do we choose the easy road that the world offers or do we take a stand and make a stand and a choice that we won't compromise our relation with the Lord and His will, His word and His ways? Because I think most of us have compromised in some way and we all need the forgiveness and mercy of God. But we've also seen the pain it brings when we choose someone else other than Jesus. I think one of the reasons why we sometimes struggle to stand strong and choose Jesus is because of some commitment issues. Sometimes because some of the experiences that we've had. Being faithful unto death seems like a fairy tale. For, for some of us, we, we're skeptical and cynical about it, about a, a happy ending. And what is it about us that we, we're afraid to really love, afraid to commit to a relationship wholeheartedly? to give our hearts vulnerably? Is it possibly because we, we don't feel like we've really been chosen? We feel like, hey, listen, if I was chosen, I might be rejected. And some of us maybe have faced rejection in different ways. And so we, we fear making a deep commitment in case the person might abandon us, might reject us. So we won't be deeply, won't be vulnerable enough and commit to the relationship. Maybe you've, you weren't chosen uh, for a sports team or a job or in a relationship. And as a result, that's created some hurt and issues in you regarding being fully committed to a relationship. And so some of us, we just find it a challenge to trust again because our trust has been broken. And I believe the Lord wants to act redemptively. And this, this message relates to singles married couples, divorcees, widowed people. It's, it's for all of us because God is a merciful, redemptive God and I believe He's a healer. And so often the residual fear of past experiences is the biggest challenge to making our choices today. And I think we just got to get real before God and say, God, maybe I do have some commitment trust issues. And Lord, that's what's keeping me back from really stepping into the blessing and fullness of a beautiful, intimate relationship with you and following you wholeheartedly. When it comes to Jesus, our bridegroom, do we have commitment issues? Do we make, have a fear in committing ourselves to Jesus? And the word commitment has the idea of devotion, of uh, a loyalty, steadfastness, but also a chance to be fully known. <clears throat> but we're dealing with a different bridegroom now, one who's pure, one who's holy, one who's loving, one who's all-knowing who always does the right thing. He's always righteous and therefore we can trust him and he is the one like no other. And he defines commitment and he makes vows and promises to you and me in his word. And he says, I wanna give you life and life more abundantly. He says, I wanna give you joy beyond measure. I wanna give you a peace that surpasses all human understanding. I wanna give you a grace that's sufficient for you every day. I want to say this to you that I'm going to never leave you. I'm never going to reject you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to be your guard till the very end. I'm going to be your comforter and your leader. I'm the unchangeable God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not moody. I'm consistent, Jesus says. That Jesus will say that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That he's the first and the last, the first, the faithful, true witness. And when we're dealing with Jesus, we're dealing with character that is rock solid, that you're building your house on something that's rock solid, that can stand the wind and the, and the storm and the rain and be unshaken because he's an unshakable God. And that here Jesus, his nature and characters, it's, it's rock solid. And so therefore we're safe when we put our trust 
and faith in Him, and He backs up those promises with His righteous character. God yearns for you, loves you. I've said it before that God loves you and is more interested in you than what you can produce for Him. And He yearns for you and He thrills, it thrills Him to disclose more of His nature to you and me and that in our relationship with God, it's about knowing Him and Him knowing us intimately that there's someone that gets to understand you truly and completely like no other human being. That it's a relationship where you can be deeply known and He loves you and He stays committed to you and wants to help you become all that He's created you to be. That He's the only one that can truly know your heart. And it's over time through commitment, the daily choice of saying, Jesus, I'm choosing you. Yes, my flesh wants to do this and that, but Jesus, I'm choosing you and your will, your word and ways. And what happens, you begin to understand the heart of the beloved. And He understands you more than you even understand yourself. And so to get to know someone else, it takes time. It takes trust. It takes vulnerability. It takes honesty and commitment. But if love is truly found in commitment, there's a harvest of things to enjoy, a future to enjoy with Jesus now and forever. And so apart from understanding his character, when he says, hey, listen, I'm wanting you to be faithful unto death. I'm wanting you to understand that you, you, you church, church of New Life, church in Smyrna, hang in there, stay committed, make daily choices until death do us part. What helps us understand apart from his character is that he has chosen you. He has chosen me. He has chosen us. What a beautiful, beautiful truth that God has chosen you. Listen to what Deuteronomy 14, 12 says, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You are chosen by Jesus. Romans 5, verse 8, that God, this is God making a choice for each of us before we even knew him intimately. It says God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He chooses me. He chooses you. He chooses us. Has a plan and a destiny for every one of us. There's something so moving in, in the book of Samuel where David was chosen to be king. He was a shepherd boy, but God saw a king. And he anoints him as king. And in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, Samuel the prophet took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Some of you need the rush of the Holy Spirit. Right now, you're feeling so weak and weary. I'm praying for the rush of the Holy Spirit to come upon you, just like it did for David. The Holy Spirit's in you. But here, what's so moving about this, the, the pouring of oil was symbolic of choice. That this was a moment that God was saying, I'm choosing you, David, to rule and reign. That here, it's God offering his acceptance and his destiny and, and saying, listen, I respect you. I love you. I choose you. I'm anointing you for this task. I'm choosing you. Yes, the anointing can also speak of breaking yokes of bondage that sometimes hinder us and hold us back. That here Jesus says, I have chosen you. That you're accepted in the beloved. That Jesus offers complete acceptance. Complete acceptance. Complete approval. Respect and love. And I'll be honest, there have been times in my journey where I've struggled, str struggled with, with acceptance. Accepting acceptance. Sometimes mo moments of unworthiness or shame or insecurity. And what I've got to remember is this, that Jesus has chosen me like he's chosen you and that I've got to be careful that I don't listen to the voice of the accuser that will use accusation and condemnation that the Bible talks about. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and so Jesus accepts you. He chooses you. You know, it was the other day I did something quite unusual. I haven't done this often, to be honest with you, but I took some olive oil at home and just having gone through this, this message and I, I took the olive oil and I anointed my forehead with this oil. And I said these words, I said, Jesus, you've chosen me to be your son. 
And I can't begin to describe to you what that just did for my soul. Understanding that Jesus, the creator of the universe, the Savior and the Lord of all lords, looks at me and also looks at you. And he says, I choose you as my son, my daughter. Wow, that should change everything about us and the way we choose him, that he has chosen us first and loves us. And so when we choose Jesus, it's him and him alone. That this is not a part of life where we just mix all the different loves together with all the other beliefs. That he's going to just be one of my many favorites. No, just like in a good marriage, we choose only one person to have and to hold. And that we cannot serve God and the world. That in Scripture, God wants to be the one and the only one because that's the way He's designed us and created us to be in a relationship of worship and adoration for Him and following Him because He has our best interest at heart every single day. Every single day. The good days and the bad days. In Exodus 20 verse 3, it says, You shall love, shall have no other gods before me. Moses proclaimed this. He said, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The psalmist said, you alone are God. There's only one God. The prophet Isaiah declared, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth, over all the nations of the earth, where nations are rocking and reeling and facing various challenges at these times. Tell you, God, He alone is God over it all. He alone is God. And there's no other. And sometimes we can spend our whole lives trying to find the one, but I tell you, we have found the one. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and His name is Jesus. And He desires a relationship with you and me. He calls us to worship Him and follow Him and choose Him daily. That today, let's, that today and every day, let's just make a choice as we wake up every morning. And yes, we've got all our different roles and responsibilities and tasks to fulfill. They would say, Jesus, I'm choosing you today. I'm choosing to follow you, your word, your will, your ways. I'm choosing to love you and serve you. Choosing to allow you, Jesus, to work in me and fulfill your plan and purpose because you're not finished with me yet, Jesus. And what happens, we begin to experience beautiful benefits and blessings and rewards. And I finished off with this. that when Jesus spoke to the believers at at Smyrna and he says, be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Saying, guys, I want you to overcome. I'm wanting you to persevere, and I'm gonna give you a reward, the crown of life. And you must know how symbolic those words were to the church in Smyrna, because the symbol of the city of Smyrna was a crown. In fact, a crown was on all their coins, and to have a crown was spoke of, of victory. It spoke of dignity. People who won, uh, fest- uh, won competitions, they would receive a crown. And when you were invited to different festivals, you'd wear garland and, and d- various crowns. But Christians had no crowns because uh, they're not serving the other pagan gods. In one sense, they were uh, dis- uh, ex- uh, ostracized from the community in different ways in terms of business and finance. But Jesus says, listen, church, hang in there, persevere, be faithful, stay committed, and I'll give you the crown of life. In other words, it's not game over. The game is on. There's a reward awaiting you. Not only are you guaranteed of my guidance and my presence and my power, but there's the reward of heaven. And I wonder if they were just like Paul the apostle who lived like this. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Jesus says, overcome. Great is your reward in heaven. That you'll be given a new crown, a new sense of rulership in your life. And I tell you this, for some of us hearing this word this morning, God's also wanting to say, as you persevere and you stay faithful to the end, you watch how God is gonna take you into new levels of rulership power, even in the business place and wherever God has placed you. So when we think of the church at Smyrna, facing all kinds of pressures, some of you facing all types of pressure, God wants to say, well done. You've chosen not to break your commitment to Him and follow Him. Take your stand because great is your reward in heaven. When everything is going wrong and everything, people are maybe undermining you and you're just feeling so discouraged and despondent that you'll just see Jesus looking at you, embracing you and loving you and saying, be faithful. 
I'm going to give you the rewards, the crown of heaven. I'm the first and last, and I've chosen you, and I've chosen you to fulfill an amazing destiny and plan. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're with us at all times. Jesus, that you encourage us to be people that would build, build our houses, not on sand, but Lord, to build our houses on the rock, and you are the rock of our salvation. That Jesus, when the storms and the seasons come and go, that Jesus would stand strong knowing, Lord, that your character is immutable, that you're unchangeable, that you are pure and you're righteous, that you back up your vows and your promise that you are the perfect bridegroom. That Jesus, you have chosen us, that you have accepted us. Lord, help us accept that acceptance. That Jesus, you're calling us to worship you fully and Lord, to choose you daily, to choose life, to choose your way, to choose your truth, to choose the life that you give each one of us. That there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is destruction. Lord, your way brings eternal life. And so right now, Jesus, I just pray for those in uh, in the sound of my voice, some who have not begun a new life in Jesus, that this would be a moment for them to open the door of their heart and say, Jesus, I welcome you in. Jesus, become my Savior. Save me from my sins. Jesus, be my Lord. Lead my life. Jesus, you're the great shepherd. You're the great God that you've overcome sin, Satan, and death, that you bring new life to each one of us. Lord, I just pray for peace to visit every home. Lord, courage for those who feel discouraged. Lord, a joy, Lord, that surpasses all understanding for those who've maybe just felt heavy and and weary in well-doing. Lord, I pray for unspeakable joy to come to hearts and homes this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray your angels encamp around your people, Lord, that they would know, Lord, that they are protected and loved by you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in Jesus' name. We love you. Who might at the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me. is love There's a place for
Well, God bless you, church. We trust and we pray that you have the most wonderful week, knowing that you have been chosen by God Almighty Himself. Just a couple of things. Don't forget to join us on Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. for prayer and devotions on Facebook Live, as well as join us for our Servolution Initiative for Mandela Day as we do a drive-through at New Life Church this Saturday coming. God bless you, church. See you next week.